Okay, great. Thank you. So we are going to continue now uh, with panel number four. And I'd like to introduce the members of the panel. Our first panelist is Mr. Gran Lum with the U.S. Department of Justice Community Relations Service. And I promise you we will not hold against you the fact that you've stolen our former staff director, who I'm sure is doing great service there with you. Um, our second panelist is Mr. William Sable with the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics. And our third panelist is Ms. Ellen Scrivener with the Police Foundation. I will ask each of you to raise your right hand to be sworn and swear or affirm that the information you are about to provide us is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge and belief. Is that correct? Thank you. Mr. Lum, you each have, by the way, seven minutes. Uh, green light go, red light stop. Okay. Uh, thank you to the Commission for letting me speak today as a representative of the United States Department of Justice and a member of the Obama administration. It's an honor to, to share with you uh, the great work that the men and women of the Community Relations Service uh, provide to communities across America. In some ways, uh, the missions of CRS and the Commission, I think, complement one another. The Commission seeks to inform the public of developments in national civil rights policy and the improve the enforcement in, in civil rights law. CRS, on the other hand, we seek to address the tensions uh, that come from the community conflicts that necessitate those laws. So while our missions are different, uh, both organi organizations share a vision to preserve the importance of, of justice and equality for all. And just recently, I uh, and uh, your former staff director, Marlene Salio, had the distinct privilege of being in, in Selma, Alabama to help commemorate the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and the historic voting march from Selma Montgomery. The violent resistance when state troopers attacked the nonviolent marchers with whips, batons, and tear gas as they tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it was on March 7, 1965, arguably marked one of the lowest points for law enforcement community relations in history. And actually, during that, that important time in history, CRS was there to resolve conflict and reduce the, the tension. CRS's first director was a man named Leroy Collins, and he worked behind the scenes to ultimately help broker the agreement for the second march. That's between King and the Alabama Street Troopers, which helped keep the peace. The agreement held. If you remember in the movie, which is shown, the, the marchers stopped in the middle of the Pettus Bridge, kneeled down, saying, we shall overcome, and King then turns the group to go back to Selma. Uh, that was an agreement that CRS helped mediate in that day. And one point in raising that is that law enforcement community relations are strained, and compromise and communication are just not easy in, in those situations. The, the marchers trying to cross the Pettus Bridge were in part spurred, of course, by the February 1965 shooting of Jimmy Lee Jackson, an unarmed a young African-American man uh, by an Alabama state trooper. Uh, Selma marchers traveled long, a long distance to pr protest police brutality, and this scenario continues today. Right? As we examined Ferguson, when another or another deadly confrontation between police and an unarmed young African American man, Michael Brown, spurred nationwide protests and demonstrations. Uh, both cases sparked an important national dialogue about community police relations. And from Ferguson to Sanford and back here to New York to Eric Gardner, CRS was on the ground from the date of each incident. A CRS worked with all the involved parties, elected officials, law enforcement, and community groups to coordinate effective community dialogues with the goal of prior prioritizing issues and developing action steps that all the parties could take to improve partnerships and strengthen mutual trust going forward. CRS has actively played uh, this sort of role in local and nation nationwide dialogues by facilitating discussions that help communities develop community capacity networks and plans to promote peace and resolve conflicts in neighborhoods and schools. In a, I would say similar to, to, to Selma today, shell diplomacy, self-martial training uh, remain useful tools during large planned protests. In 2007-2008, CRS assisted local law enforcement officials after the shooting death of Sean Bell in Queens, in New York. Those who are here today 
and our local area, area probably remember the chaos that, that happened at that time. Streets were closed, bridges were blocked. CRS provided contingency planning assistance, self-marshaling training with community organizers and police in preparation for some of those events. We responded to 25, we were involved in 25 community events and there were six highly publicized civil disobedience demonstration, demonstrations. CRS helped the community leaders and police restore peace in the city at that time. Following the September 11th terrorist attacks and with the increase in violence and misunderstanding against Arabs, Muslims, and Sikhs intensified, the need to promote and educate understanding became apparent. As a result, in that time, CRS developed an Arab, Muslim, and Sikh cultural awareness training program and what we call our AMS program. CRS AMS program is a four-hour program uh, that brings together law enforcement, government officials, and Arab Muslim Sikh communities to together to foster mutual understanding and strengthen police community relations. It covers cultural behaviors, sensitivities, stereotypes, and expectations uh, during police community interactions, individual interactions, and to supplement that training, we also created a roll call video for law enforcement called the first three to, three to five seconds. The videos were developed to provide officers with fundamental understanding of Arab, Muslim, and Sikh cultures during non-emergency interactions. Uh, in, also in following that model, uh, in 2014, CRS created a transgender law enforcement training and is, and is finalizing a roll call video as, as well. It's, it's, gotten, it's been very well received. In developing the program, we brought, to, we brought together in roundtable meetings transgender leaders, law enforcement representatives, with the goal, again, of improving relationships between transgender communities and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Currently, we're also developing a, a program for dealing with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I know this has been mentioned in, in earlier panels as, as well. It's my hope that that program, too, like the other programs, will, will enhance law enforcement's ability to recognize non-threatening behaviors from those with disabilities and help prevent tragedies like the death of Ethan Saylor, 26-year-old Maryland man with Down syndrome who died while being restrained by police. Uh, the incident was a catalyst for change. Uh, people with cognitive disabilities are increasingly being included in communities and no longer confined to institutions. Uh, the world is changing and our law enforcement must be better equipped and trained to serve its community members. Uh, we have a variety of other trainings, including law enforcement mediation training. I know I talked about earlier race, racial profiling training as well. And so there are a number of things that we do. We've, we've, we're also offering a training uh, with, uh, with the FBI and, and the Civil Rights Division as well. So I will stop there, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lum. Mr. Sable? This is on. <clears throat> this better? No, you got to. There you go. Okay. Uh, I'm Bill Sable. I'm the director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, BGS is a, uh, the principal federal statistical agency in the Department of Justice and CORDA, its mission is developing national statistical programs that describe criminal events, offenders, and the operation of justice agencies at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, important to understand about BJS is that its enabling legislation stipulates that data collected by BGS should be used only for statistical purposes, shall be gathered in a manner that precludes their use for law enforcement or other purposes relating to a private person uh, other than statistical research purposes. And I mention that because a lot of the discussion today names names and talks about people. And one of the challenges for us is to gather statistical data, describe patterns and trends, relationships between organizations and agencies, what are outcomes while protecting the privacy of individuals. Um, BGS maintains uh, a variety of programs covering all aspects, as I said, of the criminal justice system. But when it comes to police use of force, there are four in particular. I'm going to focus on two of them today. Oh, I apologize. I should have said at the outset. I apologize if I got my statement to you late, but um, you'll get the gist of it now. Um, uh, uh, but, but, but four in particular that I want to, uh, or two of the four that I want to focus on. One is a survey of citizens uh, that's part of the National Crime Victimization Survey. Uh, it's called the Police Public Contact Survey. It asks uh, a nationally representative sample of about 90,000 people, 16 above, about contacts they had with the police during the past year and asks them to describe those contacts and whether force re was used in that contact. Another one is called the Arrest Related Deaths Program, which is part of a program that BGS started 
in response to the Deaths in Custody Reporting Act of 2000 to capture uh, data on persons who die in the custody of uh, prisons, jails, en route to incarceration, or in the process of arrest. Um, in general, our approach to measuring force, just like lots of our statistics, is through a combination of um, administrative data and survey data, excuse me, so that we can um, um, so that we can compare what we get from official sources with um, <coughs> citizen perspectives. Just like the dark figure of unreported crime, where the uh, UCR crime data come only in terms of crimes known to the police, and the National Crime Victimization Survey gives us information on crimes not reported to the police, we adopt that same perspective and force um, citizen reports versus to the extent that we can get them, official statistics. So the citizen reports come from this survey called Police Public Contact Survey, and key to it on force is to try to understand the nature of the interaction between the police and the public. So it, it tries to capture the events, it tries to capture what the police do and, uh, and, and what respondents did in that context. So for example, it asks respondents about whether the police shouted at them, cursed at them, threatened them, used electroshock or pointed a gun. It asks respondents whether they disobeyed or interfered with the officer all the way to whether they physically did anything uh, to the officer. We've implemented these surveys about every three years since 1999, the most recent one being 2011, we're fielding the current one. And just a couple of statistics in terms of what we found. According to PPCS, there are about 47 million people who were 16 and above who had at least one contact with the police for a traffic stop, a pedestrian stop, or other type of contact. That number ranged between 40 and 47 million between 99 and 2001. Um, the data show that in less than 2% of those cases, did the police use force in the most recent contact um, with, with, with civilians. So that amounts to, over time, between 400 and 800,000 uh, incidents uh, of force. Given that force was used in those incidents, uh, in the majority, over three quarters of them, uh, citizens said the force was excessive. The PPCS captures a range or a continuum of force, uh, non-fatal force, including shouting, cursing, and things along those lines. And typically, the most common use of force was threaten, uh, threaten, uh, threatening or pushing or grabbing. Um, in about a quarter of the cases, respondents report the police pointed a gun at them. They used pepper spray or electric uh, shock devices in about 9% of the incidents. So the picture is that a lot of contacts, relatively small, uh, a relatively statistically small fraction of cases uh, did the citizens report that the police used force. Jumping to the back end and the data we capture on deaths in the process of arrest, we, uh, we, in response to the Deaths in Custody Act, we started collecting data through state reporting systems um, in 2003. Uh, we collected them through 2011, suspended the collection because of concerns about methodology, and I'll come back to what we're doing on that. But um, between 2003 and 2009, um, uh, captured uh, 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 the data on the civilian deaths. And one of the things that we found was that of about the 4,800 deaths we captured over that period, about 40% of them were due to a cause other than a law enforcement officer homicide. The, major the modal non-law enforcement homicide causes were suicides or intoxication deaths. Um, our data are similar to what the FBI collects in its supplementary homicide reports in what they call justifiable homicides. So, um, but, and they show some similar patterns and trends. For example, both sources show that about 30% of the persons who die as a result of law enforcement homicide were black. About 42 or 45% are white. However, we had concerns that both our data and the FBI data weren't capturing all the deaths that were occurred. So we did a study where we matched cases, did comparisons, and found that during that period between 03 and 09, um, the data were capturing only about half the expected number of deaths. In the later years, about 2011, we reduced that to about 30 percent or so uh, by using alternative methods. So our intention is to spend our uh, resources starting in May with some um, pilot studies <coughs> that will combine, I think it was mentioned by the Cato Institute, open source data, newspaper accounts, all these types of things to flag cases that are potential cases and follow up with direct reporting uh, uh, on, on, on the cases with law enforcement data. So um, uh, we're, we're working, as I said, on both ends, the citizen side and um, uh, the, the deep end, the arrest-related deaths process to try to improve those 
uh, uh, data on um, uh, what we have on police use of force. I'll stop right there. Thank you, Mr. Saylor. Ms. Scrivener? Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you do need to get a little closer to the mic, though, uh, or have the mic come closer to you. Maybe that's a better idea. All right. Is that better? Uh, you know, try the button again, I think, maybe. There you go. Is that better? Oh, yes, that's better. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And um, as, as I read the, the uh, panel names, this was the federal officials panel. In the interest of full disclosure, I am no longer a federal official, so we need to get that out on the table. I had, did have that experience, but right now I'm working in police reform, and all of my experience really tells me that's where we need to be. And what I've heard here today just confirms that. We really need to be focusing on police reform because simply changing a particular practice, such as a different training program, implementing a new uh, a, a program to respond to uh, uh, complaints, are bringing on uh, new technology, they, they will all have specific results, but that will not get us to the, the results we're seeking. Reason being, I, in my view, we are really at a very pivotal point in policing in terms of the relationships with the community, and we need to be talking about the need for systemic organizational change. I have not really heard a lot about that today in terms of changing not just different programs and different uh, uh, initiatives, but really changing organizations across the country. And of course, we're then talking about cultural change as well. Uh, and that change needs to be embedded in a core philosophy that has the capacity to change the direction of the culture of police community interactions, and that it will start to become a cohesive organizational change strategy that can be implemented across the country. But what we're really looking at, it would be embedded in constitutional policing. Clearly not all police departments have cultures that are anathema to the community, but those that do, and we've heard many examples of, of your examples today uh, in what we've so recently seen, are characterized by racist messages, over-reliance on tactics and harassment. Uh, they do not represent the community, and they tend to use force rather than words. Until Ferguson, I think many of us, myself in particular, really believe that we had witnessed a history of civil rights gains, and that culminated in the Violent Crime Control Act of 94, which introduced community policing and achieved a number of objectives that improve relationships between police and the communities they serve. And that included the introduction of the community policing philosophy that was built upon community engagement and collaborative problem solving. And those are two key foundations of community policing. And they have very, very specific kinds of meaning. However, many of us saw community policing losing priority status after the events of 9-11, which I think everyone could understand, but then also what became known as the metrics issues or the numbers game, where departments used analytics to identify potential crime hotspots. And realistically, they did start to bring crime down. However, if you lived in one of those hotspots, you may not see it as all that great, and you may question, Yes, we're bringing it down, but what are you doing to bring it down? So over and above those events, I don't think we had any idea, however, just how serious the situation it was becoming until the national spotlight was focused on Ferguson, then here on New York City, Cleveland, and then when you think it cannot get any worse, uh, we see what happens in North Car Charleston and then Tulsa, where again, unarmed men of color are being murdered. And watching those events transpire, when you were talking about Selma, it kind of like brought tears to my eyes as I watched this, realizing that we were, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Selma, and so many of us thought we had really made such tremendous gains mm -hmm. since that time and since the days of Bull Connor policing. And to find out that maybe we hadn't made the gains that we thought we had, and that maybe we were kind of kidding ourselves, was kind of difficult to accept. But we have to accept it, we have to move on, as Dolores Jones Brown talked about in her, her testimony, we've been there before repeatedly, and now we need to move forward and do something very different. We need to face what we thought was happening and hope for was not necessarily reality, and we need to lay a groundwork for new initiatives within a framework of 21st century policing strategies where the protect part of serve and protect does not mean harassment that generates nothing but anger, resentment, 
and lack of trust. You've heard here today many of the directions in which we need to go. We've heard a lot of great ideas, but we need to do it within a comprehensive way that touches all of the bases and not just with the police, but with the criminal justice system as a whole. As body cams are great for transparency, technology can define hotspots, all may be acceptable to prosecutors and courts. But if we do not have real collaboration with the community as to their use, will we ever really know their true value? And that's true of probably any implementation, even some of the, you've heard about great training programs here today. Uh, you can have the best subject matter experts, very persuasive speakers, but in, in our, we need national leadership to really start making the kinds of changes that have to occur. And within that context, the community voice needs to be heard. It needs to be more than just sitting at the table. It needs to be actively involved in, in decision making and reshaping the culture. And so we're talking a whole lot more than a citizen review board or a citizen training program. And one of the things, that, the recommendations that I will be making will be that we really start to need to look at how we can put together uh, a regional kind of co a concept of a regional uh, uh, system of institutes across the country, organizational change institutes, where police and community go there together. Police leadership and community leadership go there together to start to learn how can we change the culture of these organizations. We've got very smart people in many of these communities. They can contribute their, their ideas and their knowledge. Hopefully, the task force on 21st century policing, as, as it is the the final recommendations are released. Hopefully that too will add to this whole notion of creating comprehensive change and will open, open the opportunity for a very new kind of dialogue on race and policing because in my view, that's where we need to be if we're going to really move forward and have true constitutional policing. I offer to all of you that this, this dialogue that we've started today is a really critical first step in making those, those, that, that, those changes occur. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you. Uh, 29 minutes ago, CNN posted an article online that says, we're not seeing more police shootings, just more news coverage. Um, I, I don't know how that conclusion could be made, particularly if we know that it's difficult to collect the statistics as to what's happening. But uh, any thoughts on, on that kind of uh, perception from any of the panelists? Um, okay. Go ahead. Uh, it, it's definitely uh, difficult to collect the data, but I do think it's true we are seeing a lot more coverage. Um, um, the but do you think that implies that it's not that we're seeing more misconduct, just more coverage? Or is it that we're seeing more coverage because we're seeing more misconduct? When I look at the trends, the um, there's there's been in terms of the number, okay, so we know that the data we have, both the data that BGS has collected historically and the supplement homicides are under-reporting mm -hmm. uh, the total number of homicides. But uh, relative to the expected numbers in 11 or so, that, uh, the, or, or between 2009, 2011, that number of homicides is relatively flat. So that would lead me to believe there's definitely more coverage going on. Um, but. Um, uh, it, the, obviously, the answer to the question is uh, more complete data on the number of homicides by law enforcement officers trying to get that number down. And then a, a corollary to that, I think it ties both of my uh, panelists' comments together, is understanding um, uh, the characteristics of police departments where those things occur at higher than expected rates or lower than expected rates, whether that's the composition of the police force relative to the community or different policies and practices they might implement, whether it's proactive policing, community policing, to try to understand what's associated with that. Uh, one of the challenges is that these are, quote, statistically rare events. So we're at a floor that uh, where things, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have one or two in one year, it could be high in some community. If it goes down to zero in the next year, you know, that just could be natural variation. So it's a real challenge to try to detect those things, and it's going to take, um, you know, a, a lot of work. But I think looking for the underlying patterns of the relationships between the characteristics of the organizations and, and how they reflect the community to try to find out where the um, uh, anomalies might be, I think, is a starting point in that. I, I think maybe it's both. There's clearly more coverage. I'm told that after, right after Ferguson occurred, CNN 
had 100 people on the ground there to, to cover what was going on in Ferguson. So yeah, there's definitely more coverage and you've got more people using cell phones to film things. So, But with all of that said, I don't think we would have had a national task force on policing if this wasn't an issue. And that the, the issues that we're seeing spring up across the country, they're happening in many different kinds of places. They're not all happening in just a small rural area. They're kind of across the board. And what, what people have witnessed and seen I think they've been pretty shocked about it. And so I think the, and I think most police chiefs as well who are involved in leadership positions will acknowledge the fact that there are things that are going on that are wrong and that they need to change. So I think it's an answer to your question. It's both there's more reporting, but that's not, it's not magnifying issues uh, out of perspective. I think the, the issues are, are there. Yeah. Sure. I would. I would just add that I'm not going to make a judgment as to whether it's happening more or less, but it's clear there's a lot more coverage above the fold. CNN covers Charleston. And I would even note the difference. You go back to the case of the Trayvon Martin case, which was the first big case that really mm -hmm. propels this. It took much longer for that case from the moment the situation happened to the protest. It's just telling about the difference that social media is making and how quickly and, and, and creating more transparency, mm -hmm. quite, clearly. No, thank you. Commissioner Cladney? Uh, Mr. S uh, Sable, uh, so do you, has anyone, one, uh, made a recommendation of tying federal funds to reporting of all sorts of crimes uh, to your office? Um, no. Uh, uh, so uh, Division of Labor, um, the FBI collects data through the Uniform Crime Reporting Program has done so for 80 years, and uh, it's directly reported by local law enforcement agencies to the FBI through state programs. BJS uh, administers National Crime Victimization Survey, which is a household survey of about 190,000 people that are interviewed annually to ask about their victimization experiences. So that's how we get crime data versus the FBI. And. Uh do you understand it to be true that the FBI doesn't all get these crime these crimes don't all get reported to them? That's correct. Uh, and have you ever thought yourself about what your recommendations would be or anybody else on the panel to make sure that these crimes get reported? I mean, we heard testimony this morning: eighteen thousand police departments, a million police officers, or sheriffs, deputies, whatever. Uh, do you have any opinion on that? Well, statistical agencies in the country typically operate under uh, the presumption that participation is voluntary. Um, and it's based on a concept of trust and credibility. That is that um, we're honest, credible brokers that people will give us the data, will treat it appropriately, and put it out. And I think that's a, a really core principle, uh, a good principle as opposed to simply mandating things. Um, we have, BJS has done mandated collections. Uh, we do work under the Prison Rape Elimination Act that Congress mandated. We do that. And one of the things we've learned, even under that, some people don't participate uh, when it's mandatory. Even when the uh, PREA commissions had uh, the, uh, when they were calling out people with high rates of prison rape and so on and so forth. So mandating doesn't necessarily uh, 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 ensure compliance. There, I think the voluntary participation kind of goes to the core of one of the principles of our, of our, of our country of democratic participation. And personally, I'd, I'd prefer people would want to give us the data. We treat it appropriately that they're uh, responding, um, you know, uh, uh, as part of their, civilian, their, their, their civil responsibilities to provide accurate data to inform the nation about what's happening in crime or police shootings or whatever the statistic of interest may be. So what you're saying is, is if, we re if it remains voluntary, you're going to get about as much response as you've got? Uh, well, again, on, in terms of uh, what, um, the FBI numbers. The FBI numbers. Well, and the stuff we're getting on the arrest-related deaths, it's also, um, well, it's interesting, the act reads that Congress is providing encouragement to the states to provide data on deaths in the process of arrest. The encouragement is a penalty. Oh, the encouragement is a penalty through a potential reduction in funding through one grant program. 
Um, and that's a discretionary penalty uh, for the Attorney General. Um, uh, our approach is, is essentially to triangulate, to use multiple methods to try to identify, capture and, uh, the events, and then follow up and confirm them and uh, capture the data on those. Um, I think that we can do well with that methodology. I say that based in part in the last couple of years of the program before we temporarily suspended to do the methodological work we were seeing improvements, particularly where our methodology was applied more rigorously and consistently across states, and we were using more open source to nominate and follow up. So I think there's value in continuing um, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this vein. Um, uh, as said, uh, you know, or as a mandate doesn't necessarily ensure compliance, and a mandate raises a whole bunch of issues about what compliance means. So for example, um, uh, even under the Deaths in Custody Act, it's a little unclear what compliance is. So if, a, if, if this, through the states or the law enforcement agencies, they provide a count of the number of deaths, but not every element that Congress has specified. Is that full compliance? Is that good faith effort? Is that um, partial compliance? And, and it raises a lot of questions about how one measures that, uh, particularly, as I said, with a, a, a potential uh, with a penalty. So do we reward good faith effort or do we punish good faith effort um, in, in, these, uh, in these issues? Okay, let me, let me try it this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of compliance do you think you have in your programs? Um, in the BGS programs, quite high. For example, we survey law enforcement agencies. Well, we actually conduct a census of them to uh, uh, capture data on their characteristics, and we get about 99% response rate. We do a sample survey about 3,700 agencies periodically, and we get over 90, 95 percent response rates. And we're asking questions about, you know, uh, programs, policies, practices, things along those lines. So we have very high compliance in the surveys that we do uh, on those I I I in those programs. Any idea with the FBI or I know that's not your agency. Yeah. Either. Well, so in the UCR, um, I, I vaguely I don't I don't remember the details off the top of my head. Um, so. I, so we should ask them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Yaki? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to follow up on, on some of what Commissioner Cladney had to say, one of the, I asked the previous panel the question about is there a way to uh, condition federal funds on, and I wasn't even talking about, I was talking beyond data. I was talking about instituting procedures by which to uh, discipline uh, police officers with a high number of, of complaints or something along those lines. But I think it's applicable to this situation as well, which is how much, how, how confident are you that the data that you're getting is accurate and true versus there may be some cooking of the books, as one person's put it, to make sure their community wasn't number one or number two in and these kinds, these kinds of reports, or it didn't want to show up on some top ten list, whatever it is that communities do because they don't like to be, be, be seen as the bottom feeders of, of uh, any particular societal problem. Uh, I'd just like your comment on that. Sure. So with respect to the, quote, deaths in the process of arrest part, uh, it just in that case, to give one example, um, between in the middle 2000s when uh, we had lower participation rates versus by 2011 we had used multiple methods, I, the estimated uh, reliability or accuracy or uh, actually the technical term is scope of coverage went from about 50 percent covered to 70, 75 percent covered. Okay. So, so again we use various methods to try to estimate how well we're doing. So yeah, I think we've improved it with enhanced methodologies. And again, the concept is multiple methods to capture the same type of thing. So there's, uh, it allows for external corroboration of any particular numbers. Now, one of the challenges implicit in your question is, is what do we report out? So we don't report a roster of agencies and their rates. Not that we're precluded from naming agencies, but the modal number of deaths in the that we collect, but from agencies that we collected over the years was one. So if we name an agency, we're essentially naming the decedent, and I know they're all public, but our statute precludes us from identifying 
persons, and there are the families of the dissidents and, and folk like that to consider. So, um, so our challenge do becomes. You, let me just ask. You know, I mean, do you think that in the in the in the age of Twitter, in the age of Facebook, in the age of social media, is that as relevant now as it was when this statute was first enacted? Because it seems like everyone knows the instant something may or may not happen. I, and I and I raise a point about about what the chairman said about CNN, uh, that headline, because just to make a very clear point, Walter Scott at North Charleston would never have been reported but for the fact that someone was standing by there with a cell with a cell phone camera. That would have never made it anywhere. And and on another set of statistics that I know that our uh, our uh, Dr. Galladay was was struggling has been has been working with in terms of a report we're also doing on stand your ground is the absolute paucity of statistics on when police use their discretion to determine that a that a homicide is deemed lawful and therefore not entered into the books as any, any even though the police mm -hmm. may be making a conscious decision that may be wrongful in that instance how many times is that happening and not being reported as well so I mean there are a lot of I, I just wonder how relevant it is now in in when in the pursuit of transparency and accuracy we want and quite frankly what other panelists talked about which was the public shaming of some of these departments to get their acts together uh, why why we would want to hold back that kind of information yeah. so um, other information that I think that would be informative is um, uh, is there something about the North Charleston Police Department that's similar to other police departments? And there are groups of police departments that are behaving in the same way. That that's uh, an important finding that we're trying to undertake. We're planning to data mine the data or study or whatever to try to look at those things. So I think that would be an informative contribution. That um, I'm just making this up because I haven't looked at the data. Departments without community policing or a proactive policing where the racial imbalance between the police department and the community is such and such and such and such are more likely to report True, deaths but, like that. But, but, the, but the fallacy of that approach is that but for the person with the cell phone camera, there would be nothing to report. There would still be the uh, hummus. We would still capture that data as a death in the process of arrest and try to capture the information. And you are pointing out a really important point, which is why I said at the outset, when we think about data collection, we want to try as best we can. Don't do it all the time because it's really to get a public and police perspective. So in that survey that we do, you know, we have uh, information on a continuum of force. Police yell at you, kick you, point a gun at you. Um, in principle, with administrative data, and you're going to hear from Dave Klinger and others and folk who have captured those data, if, that, if a similar type of continuum of force is measured from police departments, we can assess whether or not there's corroboration between the two. Okay. You're absolutely right. But, but, but right. in the Scott case, uh, the, the, the video camera showed something that we would not have seen from official statistics. That's an ongoing challenge that we're trying to get. But I go back to what we're, with what we're trying to do in these cases now by relying on open source, whether it's a, new, a media report or something like that, we capture an element that we can use when we then contact the police department for confirmation or not. We don't necessarily take the report as gospel because we have this other information right. and we try to uh, do some kind of forensic audit to try to figure out what's going on with it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had a question. When we, uh, I attended a, a briefing by our Illinois State Advisory Committee on hate crimes and the reporting of hate crimes. And there, there was a testimony as to inconsistencies in how a particular locality might view something or define something as a hate crime versus a federal statute. So we weren't looking at the stats that were there. We're not apples to apples. Do we have a similar situation when we're dealing with the use of, of a deadly force by police officers uh, when you're comparing federal and, and local uh, descriptions or definitions? So what we try to do is define a set of elements that we capture in any event. Um, so that's why this deaths in the process of arrest doesn't just limit itself in terms of its scope simply to what police departments say was a justifiable homicide or something like that. It captures information from the time of the interaction with the police. Mm -hmm. So we try to capture those elements and then we can place them into a bin 
and so we can make some decision about where we think they fall. Um, so by, by, again, by trying to get at the underlying uh, attributes or elements, it gives us the opportunity to classify. One of the challenges it always presents, and people have said this about a lot of BGS statistics, is that our numbers don't match up with theirs. And that's simply because we're trying to apply some uniform definition, whether it's a count of prisoners or something like that, across jurisdictions mm -hmm. so we can compare across jurisdictions. I have a comment on that. Uh, I reference police reform and the collaborative reforms that the cops office is funding. And in many of those collaborative reforms, that's one of the issues that they're working on, working with the police department to look at their data, how accurate are their data. And I'm not talking about data that they're reporting to the federal government, data that they can use themselves to figure out what's actually happening out there on the streets, who are they stopping, how often, what's the level of contraband. But it's, it's more than just that type of, type of thing as well. It's how, how are they using the officers? Are they using the officers to the, in, in the best way possible? And so you can get an awful lot from data, but the collaborative reform moves in on that, and they've got like six months to really zero right in on that. And then they've got a year following that to continue to go back and look at are they still doing what what they what everybody agreed needed to be done and, and is it still working out or is there some changes that need to be made it's a very flexible system except it, it but it also gives you very solid information thanks Ms. Scrivener um, Commissioner Actenberg uh, Ms. Scrivener and uh, Mr. Lum uh, first you Ms. Scrivener you said we need systemic organizational change embedded in constitutional policing principles right I think I agree with that but I'm not really clear <laughs> it sounds <laughs> it sounds very good what what are the elements um, well what I was talking about is we let me back up for a minute we've been like talking all day and and so many different uh, meetings that I go to we're talking about really good things like implicit bias training very good procedural justice training I'm talking about let's bring that together into a more systemic cohesive way and the, the way we do that is we start to look more at uh, uh, how, how you make organizational change within an organization not just changing a specific program but really changing the whole organization from top to bottom in ways that need to be changed and one of the ways that you could do that is if and but that does require resources if we develop like a network of uh, John Jay would be a good example of one where people could come together police and citizens together to work on how are we going to change the culture of this organization and embedded in that cultural change is the constitutional policing and I think we pretty much know what constitutional policing is based on the Department of Justice pattern and practice initiatives because mm -hmm. When they go in and they look at the patterns and practices, inevitably what they're really looking at are, are patterns and practices that lead to unconstitutional policing behavior, whether you call that misconduct or what, basically it's, it's people aren't being served appropriately there. And so you, you start to bring all that together rather than, I, my concern is we don't approach it like a bunch of different silos. I understand. That we start to, to start to weave it together. And I'm not suggesting that's easy, but I do think we, we, we've really started to identify the framework and what the pieces need to be. Now we need to start putting them together. And so I'm going to turn that back to you guys to do that, so, or help anyway. Well, luckily for us, we don't do anything. <laughs> well, we do a lot of things. No, but you can we tell everybody. We make recommendations. We make recommendations. <laughs> That's what we do. All right, good. Um, Mr. Lum, she also made reference to um, the community voice needing to be heard. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit, bit more about what such a uh, process might um, consist of? Right. Capturing the community voice in, in cases like this? I, I really like Ms. Scrivener's point of, you know, if, com if community oriented policing, it really is about collaborative problem solving and it is about bringing the community. But the communities can be at different states. Are they really ready? It could be a recent immigrant community the Somalian community or the Burmese community that's recently moved in, they may not be as ready to engage in that. So I think uh, a group like Community Relations Service can help play the third party because it, depending on, for example, the there may be great mistrust 
of law enforcement. There's a, mm -hmm. There may not be a willingness to immediately come to the table and by first having conversations amongst themselves to bring together leaders that they can self-identify or to develop leaders, that's a way that then they'll, they will then be able to engage with law enforcement to come together, uh, maybe with a, a facilitator to, to increase the ability of true engagement. I think that is an important piece, we, uh, as, as Ms. Scribner talked about, which is if you're going to have cultural change, the community has to be engaged with it, right? It can't just be independent happening without their voices included in that. And, and I think training can be helpful to, to, to folks. Um, community advocates can be helpful. Uh, the, the community organizations are the ones who have pushed a lot of what's going on here around th this issue about access to the force, and they are, they're, they're going to have to be part of the answer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Narasaki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry. So I have um, a few questions. One for Mr. Uh, Sable. Are the studies that are done, I, I'm very interested in the surveys that you do, are they done in Spanish and are they done in various Asian and other languages? Uh, Spanish language and um, so the Census Bureau conducts it and they have, um, uh, if, if, if Asian language is needed, they have a call-in service to help translate. But Spanish language is one of the instruments that's used uniformly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, and have you seen any differences in terms of, because uh, I used to be with an organization and we would do some public opinion research focus groups with the Asian community. We would find that you had to be really careful how you translated the questions and how you asked the questions because as Mr. Lum pointed out, many are new immigrants and you know see civil rights terminology in a different way. Um, with respect to Asians in the sample, I can't, I don't, uh, specifically, I don't, I, don't, don't, I don't know. I mean, I could get you, I could talk to the Census Bureau folk to find out what challenges they have. With respect to Spanish language, we've measured a change in uh, improvement in response rates simply by translating surveys into Spanish. It's been pretty obvious. So I've seen improvements from doing that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to thank, uh, Director Lum for coming, because <laughs> I know it was fairly short notice. Uh, the Pasco chief of police noted that mm -hmm. they had reached out to CRS and uh, to ask for help in facilitating community conversations mm -hmm. given the, the, the recent incident that was there mm -hmm. and the heightened tensions there. Um, I'm wondering the degree to which uh, the various parts of the Department of Justice who work on these issues are working together. I know this administration has done a lot to try to break down the silos among agencies and mm -hmm. uh, pr provide a more holistic approach to things. And we read a lot of positive things about the COPS program being sort of the intermediary uh, step between a Department of Justice investigation, mm -hmm. which uh, by its nature is a little bit adversarial, COPS, which may be coming in and being seen as a technical assistance provider. Mm -hmm. And then what, what would the CRS role be, and how do, how do you get to the holistic change that uh, Ms. Scribner is talking about? R right. Thanks, Commissioner Narasaki, for that question. Uh, so there, I think there has been an attempt within the Department of Justice to break down those silos. I, I think that's very much, much the case, whether it was in Ferguson or in Sanford, or in, or in San Pasco, Washington, and other situations like that. And it's important. There, there's, a, there's a lot of fe federal resources that can be brought to bear on these situations. And it's important because the community that's involved, they don't see different components. They just see Department of Justice. So I think that's true. I do want to say very carefully, though, for CRS, we have to be very careful to stay within what I would say our lanes are, be, because we do not litigate, we do not investigate, and we are there to be an impartial third party. So, the, so we, in, in, in certain situations, have to act very separately and keep confidentiality and not seek publicity for work in which you're trying to work between parties, say law enforcement, government officials, community, because you're trying to help them work through a situation. We stay away from the other portions that are investigation and, and prosecutory. But in those situations <coughs> where the circumstances are appropriate, we're trying to help them work out their own problems. We're trying to help them work solutions when, it, when, when appropriate uh, to the issues that they face uh, around these issues. 
Uh, and we had um, <clears throat> we had people testify about the important need to bring in uh, line officers as well as chiefs of police. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if you've seen good examples of that. Uh, anyone on the panel in terms of you know really trying to drive change, not just at the chief leadership is always important mm -hmm. as well, but leaders can only lead if people actually want to follow them, right? So. Yeah, I'll just speak real quickly. I think my, some of my uh, colleagues in this panel might have something to say as well. Uh, I think it's, it is, you certainly need it driven from the top. And in our work, at least at CRS, it's a, certainly the, the middle management ma matters greatly as to what the actual uh, patrolman on the street is, is actually doing. The positive stories I would have is, and I, I mentioned all the trainings that we had before, we, we provide them for all levels. and even when they're coming out of the academy. You know, we've done training uh, on, on, say, the sick cultural competency, where they learn something. You can see that when you increase knowledge, people will act differently. Or they, it, when you reduce ignorance, there can be change in that. So I think it, it, it does have to be throughout the organization. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I've, I've had a lot of experience of sitting down at the table with all the stakeholders from the community and the line officers, the officers who are working in that community, not just the police chiefs or the supervisors or the, the captains. I think you heard Sean Smoot talk early today about the union needs to be at the table. If you're going to have buy-in, that's pretty critical. And I will tell you right now, initially those meetings can be very uncomfortable. Nobody trusts each other. Nobody really likes each other. But over time, they start to build up some respect for one another's position because they begin to realize that they're all after the same thing. They want safe neighborhoods and neighborhoods where people can see their kids playing out in the street or they can walk to the grocery store without worried about being shot or harassed by police. And so as, as they start to learn that from each other, you see a lot more engagement. When I talked earlier about collaborative engagement. That's not just a, a nice term. That really means we're going to work together. This is not cooperation. This is not coordination. This is you and me working together to create something that's going to make it better for all of us. And it takes some time to get there, but, I, but that was kind of a foundation of community policing. And once that starts to happen, then you will see change begin to occur and and we were seeing it all over the country really but then things changed unfortunately what well, really it hadn't gotten the roots that it needed and hopefully we can try to reroute it so I have one final question for you and that is because uh, because you're not in government so you don't have a um, personal interest in this but so uh, the Department of Justice uh, seems to the investigations they bring seem to play a very important role in trying to help drive change mm -hmm. right in fact they can uh, be a tipping point uh, with organizations um, what's your sense in terms of it it doesn't seem like they have capacity to bring that many lawsuits uh, and I'm wondering what your sense is in terms of whether there is sufficient funding for all the different parts uh, of the federal government that need to be playing a role and, well, and how important is the litigation because usually you know people uh, a lot of times when we have hearings people have different viewpoints about uh, whether it's a good thing or not that mm -hmm. the feds are aggressively uh, uh, litigating something and I was really struck by the fact that so many chiefs of police were saying it was actually a good thing so yeah well yeah it, it, not telling you anything that you don't know that initially really all we saw were consent decrees until the 94 crime act that's when the pattern and practice initiative was, was part of that crime act and now the justice department could go in just based on a series of, of, of complaints that they were hearing they didn't have any but have to have somebody file an actual suit so that became very different than the consent decree and that they they still have people out on out in the departments working with the departments and the police chiefs like this now that it's turned to the point where the cops office and the civil rights division are uh, encouraging police officers to ask for that kind of assistance rather than they go out there first so that's that's kind of a sea change this the consent decree is still out there and there are probably some issues that the only way they're going to get solved is through a consent decree consent decrees are costly but the cities really have to come up with that money or the counties who the, the somebody has to come up with it, not the Justice Department so 
they will go out there and do that work and they usually last longer probably much longer than mm -hmm. anybody ever anticipates they're going to last so i think given the length of time the cost and uh the the, the fact that change is relatively slow with consent decrees because of all the different people that have to weigh in uh, my sense, and this is not not my this is just my sense of what i'm seeing based on my own experience having been in the justice department but also what i'm seeing now I think that there are many people that are really moving in the direction of the pattern and practice uh, initiatives and, and trying to avoid the consent decree unless it would be absolutely necessary and that's the only way you can go. Okay. Got a few extra questions. Uh, Mr. Sable, you mentioned in your remarks that there's uh, a number of uh, changes that are going to be happening at BJS or fixes that you're going to make. What's the timeline that you anticipate for that to be uh, completed? Um, well, we're doing the uh, one pilot study on the restaurant desk. It starts in May. Hope to have some preliminary results by December. Um, uh, in terms of capturing data on a wide array of force from police departments, this is a long-term effort. And again, I know you hear some more about this in the next panel. So we'll be having an expert panel meeting um, uh, later this summer or fall to uh, help identify what's important. I think there's been a lot, I think the survey work we do, do shows something about the extent uh, to which force is used in traffic stops. I think there's a question about what's important to capture and improve policing, like what are the, um, uh, what elements are important for training or changing police behavior. So that's kind of the frontier on that. So start with an expert panel and then uh, pilot test. I want to rely on some of the results that the researchers are, who are working on use of force are, are, are fielding right away just in terms of, of uh, uh, saving money. So probably wouldn't be fielding surveys for a year. And then we'll, later this year we'll implement, we'll survey between July and December, uh, we'll do that police public contact survey again. So those are the basic things in the next year. Oh, and then the fourth thing is uh, even though we know the both our data and SHR data, the Supplement Homicide Report data on justifiable homicides are limited. We're going to conduct that study, start looking at the relationships between agencies, characteristics, and outcomes. Uh, could you restate the last one? Our, our, oh, um, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. The Supplement Homicide Reports on Justifiable Homicides that the FBI collects, our study of it and our data to try to understand if there's any relationship between characteristics of police departments and uh, these law enforcement homicides. We'll start that this fall. Once now, again. Yeah. did you get it? No. Okay. Okay. Slowly, could you S say S supplementary SHR? homicide reports uh, of the FBI? I got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, now, the FBI data that's collected only uh, includes uh, police shootings that result in a fatality. So, this additional uh, force data that you're going to survey on would that also include uh, police shootings? Um, that don't involve uh, or don't result in a death and as well as other officer involved shootings? Um, in principle, that's what we would like to try to do um, uh, to capture the array of uh, uses of force, but um, uh, yes. But, um, uh, you know, I go back to the comment made before and, and this uh, uh, about the 18,000 police departments. Collecting data from 18,000 police departments is expensive and challenging, so we want to start small with sort of sample-based methods. Maybe limit our efforts to the largest hundred departments or something that is... But that type of data that from type those of data, departments. Yeah. Okay. But then there are comparability, scope, measurement issues that we have to work through. And again, on the next panel, I'm sure you'll hear, hear more about this, so we've got to um, uh, build slowly on that. Um, uh, yeah, so those, uh, uh, in terms of uh, a broader array of officer-involved shootings, that would be the longer-term goal to capture that. Something and then like a question that. for any one of you. Our uh, Missouri State Advisory Committee points out to us in their preliminary advisory mm -hmm. memo that the U.S. lags behind uh, in international standards regarding police accountability and the use of force. Do any of you have any knowledge about international standards and how maybe there's some best practices there that we could apply here? I only know about the statistical standards. <laughs> about the what? <laughs> the international statistical standards. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, 
Yeah, maybe I'll watch the next. I, I panel. think one of the differences is many uh, internet, many departments are you know in other countries they have like a national mm -hmm. police force where we have the right. you know eighteen thousand and they're all over the place and have different ideas on how things should be done. I mm -hmm. think that is a major difference. It may be easier for them internationally to do certain things that it would be almost impossible for the U.S. to do. Yeah, good point. Thank it, you. It may be worth talking to some um, International Association of Chiefs of Police, um, an organization like that might have some data on that. That's a good idea. Uh, commissioners, any other questions? Commissioner uh, Cladney? Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe uh, Sean Galladay of uh, OCRE has a question. Okay. You want to come up here, uh, Doctor? Thank you. My question is for uh, Mr. Sable, and I know um, BJS supplies roughly those statistical analysis center grants, which I believe r range in between sixty to one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Is there any way that uh, those grants can be at least special? And they have a lot of times they have this have special issues um, that they encourage states to tackle. Statistical analysis centers who work with states around the country, local jurisdiction. Is there any way that we can? Those, well, those uh, grants can be leveraged to kind of help local jurisdictions um, collect data on police shootings or n fatal or non-fatal police shootings? Um, yeah, so there are two parts to that grant program. One is the one you identified where the statistical analysis centers can get 50,000, 60,000. Um, and the topics they work on are open right. to them. And we've identified uh, police fatalities as a priority area in the past, uh, and um, it, it still is. A second opportunity is we have what we call an enhancement grant, which is essentially a three-year program at about 150 a year to um, uh, uh, develop statistical infrastructure that's informative for the state and locality, but also it, uh, helps us understand data that might be available that we could capture. So that program can be used in that way. Um, the solicitation's closed or just closing. I haven't seen what people have come back with this year uh, in terms of applications. In the past, though, folk have collected data on um, uh, use of force, but um, I don't know what, they're, what they've done this year. But yeah, they definitely could be used. Is there an effort to encourage states and local jurisdictions to do just that? Well, the, there, you know, it, it, there are a lot of priorities, um, and so uh, our goal has always been to um, uh, state priority areas. So, for example, we want to know a lot about what happens in the courts. We don't have good court data uh, for a variety of reasons, so that's a priority area. We want to improve the use of criminal history records uh, for um, understanding flow through the system, so that's a priority. So, so um, we're, we're really leaving it up to the, to the states to uh, negotiate that with whether they're in the governor's office or university with the agenda that's really important for them, um, in part because we always view this funding as seed money, not permanent money, where it's an opportunity to take, a, I know it's not a lot, but over three years to sort of experiment with something and hopefully establish its relevance so that either the state supports it or if it's data that we could use, we could support it on a permanent basis. So it's designed to allow that kind of experimentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Narasaki. Thank you. I just had one more question, and that is uh, we've talked a lot about what the federal government role is, what the police chief's role is. Uh, I'm wondering what, if any, the role is of governors uh, of these states, what could be being done more on a state level uh, to really help police departments be successful, to set them up for success. Do they play much of a role now? In the experience I've had, no. They play a big role with state police, yeah. but in terms of local police, no, mm -hmm. you're talking really the mayor, the city council. Um, but that, that, that's, I'm just basing that on my own experience. Others may have had very different experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm probably going out of my area of expertise, but I mean, I agree with Ellen. Uh, Policing is local. It's not primarily a state function except for the state police, but state's attorneys general can set priorities and establish what, you know, uh, at least uh, go on record as saying this is important stuff to bring forward and investigate. So they, so 
they, they can have a role uh, in that way. It's not the governor, but it's coming out of the governor's office. Yeah. Do local police get any kind of state funding for anything? Uh, there might be grants. Um, yeah, they could, uh, they could get some state grants, yeah. mm -hmm. depending on and what the nature of the of the, or the level of um, how the grant is, is set up for uh, if it's only for state initiatives then they can't but if they if it could go into local or they could be partners with somebody they might be able to get some they can also money. get federal grants through the state portion of the burn jag mm -hmm. where they can right. apply for the federal money in that way it, it just seems to me that when you end up with a uh, horrific tragic incident happening even though it's happening in a city it sort of tars the state as well right the reputation of the state and there might be maybe mm -hmm. more of a role for governors or s attorney generals or others to be playing than they're playing now and some of some of the homeland security grants are administered statewide mm -hmm. and 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 they but they cover local expenses great thank you uh, seeing no other questions I think we're going to uh, thank uh, this panel for their uh, participation and what we will do now is take a 10-minute break uh, while panel uh, our last panel gets set up thank you